Huzzah, Rangers! This is Phil Harris here at the Jacks Rangers Show, and this and every single episode of the Jacks Rangers Show is sponsored by our friends at Inkify. Make sure you follow them on Instagram, everybody out there. Uh, if you need screen printing for T-shirts or embroidery for patches, whatever, done right. Go to our guy, Carlos. He's out there in Walpole, really close to Foxborough. Same road. It'll take you all the way to see the Patriots. He's there with his small business, U.S. manufacturing. Everything is done in-house there with the shirts. You will not regret working with Inkify if you need T-shirts done. Tell them TJRS sent you, and you'll get 15% off your entire order. Let me bring Dave in here. Uh, Dave, how the hell are you? Doing fantastic, Phil. How are you? Not too bad, Double D. We've got a very, very special guest this time around. This is Mason. I learned this just now. Cook uh, is the, the way that he pronounces his last name. It All is right. not Coke. It is Cook, the mustache man himself. How the hell are you, Mason? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Thanks for having me. Excellent. Excellent. Love the hoodie. We were talking about it off screen there. Um, one of the originals. I, I, I noticed it right away. I was like, this is like an OG Free Jacks merch uh, hoodie there. So yeah, happy that you're able to join us tonight. Let's get right into it. Where are you from, Mason? I'm from Corville, Iowa, which is East Iowa. Okay. Um, big city for Iowa, but middle of nowhere to most. Yep. Yep. A um, lot of uh, farming out that way. Uh, did your, did your family come from a farming agricultural back, background? A lot of farming. Uh, a lot of my family raised sheep. Um, okay. A lot of my family have land, all sorts of things. So, yeah, we, we do that. How did you get involved in rugby? Uh, oddly enough, um, there is high school rugby in Iowa. It's it's coming wow. up and down, and it's been small. Um, we, for the most part, when at least when I was there, we only did seven. So I played sevens in the spring. Okay. Started my sophomore year in high school, and then uh, I moved on. I ended up going to Dartmouth, and I played there. So, yeah. As we know, I mean, Dartmouth is right in the backyard of, of where I am, and I mean, everybody in New England, if you are familiar with rugby, you know that Dartmouth is has been a powerhouse, and men's and women's as well. I mean, they do a fantastic job. That we're going to get a little bit more into that later on. But I've got to ask you about the mustache, as somebody that you know, the, our branding is like a mustache guy with uh, wearing pit vipers. So, like, sure. we immediately when we saw that you were signed, we're like, oh, this is this is him. This is the guy. So, tell us about the origin story of the mustache. Sure thing. Um, so I guess it's I grew one for the first time when I was at Dartmouth. Okay. Um, f- just as sort of a we went on a spring tour every year. Yep. Um, we travel wherever and and stay for a week, ten days over spring break, mm-hmm. and everybody would grow a mustache. And yeah, I had an affinity for it kind of early on. Yep. Um, and I figured I would stick with it, and I just decided yeah, I'm going to keep this until we lose. It'd be bad juju to shave it. Sure. Um, and then, you know, one of the years it happened that we, we just didn't lose the rest of the spring, oh, perfect. Um, which was which was a good year yeah. um, and led to kind of more continued mustache growth. And now it's just become something that I don't like to get rid of. And it's stuck around. It's fantastic. I mean, it's great, you know, markability uh, for that. Like, obviously, with the Free Jacks, I'm sure they're going to work with you with the mustache because they're so good on social media. I mean, just look at the Eagle, right? There's so many guys that they've, you know, elevated with the reputation just based on social media posts and stuff like that. So I'm sure that they're going to work something out with you. Um, Any desire to grow a mullet? I I know you're bald on top. Uh, Any desire? I, I wish I was capable. I'll okay. give it a go. Maybe yeah. if there's if there's enough external pressure, but yep. I don't think I'd be very successful, to be honest. Let me tell you, I, don't don't let that hold you back because I have the worst mullet of all time, and uh, it's still you know it's still there, uh, and people are just like, you need to cut that off, man. But I'm just I'm I'm determined. I'm just gonna keep going with this. So yeah, here we there we go. There we That's go. all it is at the end of the day: patience <laughs> exactly. and determination. Amen. Heck yeah. Uh, the Free Jacks are owned and operated by what the Mark, Mike, uh, excuse me, Matt McCarthy calls the um, the cabal of Dartmouth. He's a you know crotchety Free Jacks hater, but um, you're a Dartmouth guy, as we've discussed. Did Mags or Eric Anderson reach out to you directly and say it's time to come home, or give you some sort of secret word that you guys <laughs> use amongst yourselves? Like, what was all that about? Um, you, you know, neither of those guys really spoke to me too much directly. Yeah. I've spoken with both of them kind of plenty of times sprinkled here and there, but it was always sort of, 
there's a little bit of mystique to it. It wasn't super direct. Um, Tom Kindly is a guy I know from way back. He actually was, um, I think my sophomore year at Dartmouth for sure, but six or seven years ago, um, we met and, you know, kind of every year I've been in sort of a transition point, whether it was early on or right before I got drafted, there were some thoughts that maybe I would um, end up in New England kind of between the last couple of seasons between Austin and Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, I nearly ended up here. So um, well, there's been some draw to it for me, obviously, with with the cabal here. Um, yes. Yeah. The guys that I have a lot of confidence in and, and who I think build a good culture. So it's yeah, nice I mean, to have it, it has to be a good fit, right? With with those guys, you know, running the ship and TK, you know, because he was a he worked at Dartmouth, you know, prior to getting this free jacks gig. So there's obviously some familiar familiarity there as well. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, because Dartmouth guys, like, here's what's weird is like everybody knows Harvard, like prestige, uh, immediate recognition, uh, you know, brand recognition. But Dartmouth, ten years after graduation, those guys and gals are making the most amount of money. So, you know, what was your major? Like, what do you what do you do outside of rugby? Sure. Um, I I double majored in biology and econ. Mm -hmm. um, so I got a bit of a mixed background. I was kind of intending on going to medical school, oh, which okay. might still be in the cards post rugby. Who knows? Sure. Um, we'll see. But um, sort of in the meantime, I've, I've worked as um, like a patent agent where I've been doing um, like advising for biotech companies and kind of helping them navigate turning their research data into patents or finding out if things are patentable even in the first place. Kind of a, a mixed bag on that front. That's been something that I've done kind of alongside um, the rugby, but I've been fortunate enough the last couple of years to really just kind of focus on the rugby and keep up my independent study a little bit. Nice. Throwing around going back to medical school, like I said. Incredible. Um, Incredible. But I mean, you know, we have a potential doctor, you know, talking to us right here. So that's pretty cool. I always like to talk to you Dartmouth guys because I went to South Carolina. You know, I, I, w I come from a North Carolina public school background. So like listening to you guys talk, I'm just like, man, this is great. I wish my brain was this big. Um what do you miss about New England since graduating from Dartmouth? Oh, a lot. I, I really like Dartmouth. It treated me really well. Um, I love the environment, just kind of the people. And um, I think there's a it's sort of an unspoken, like there's a bit of a grittiness, you know, yeah. even if you're, it, I just like the vibe of a New England town mm -hmm. um, and the way everybody approaches kind of their lives in a like independent, but together way. And that sort yeah. of like idealistic, rugged individual individualism is really captured by i think new england and i don't know it's just it's just the kind of people i like to be around so I, I agree here. yeah man i'm not from here but I, I i chose to move up here and you know i i don't regret the decision and i'll probably never go back to the south it's just too humid down there and the people are <laughs> gritty as hell man like there's something about like the winter everybody knows that it's gonna suck and we're all prepared to you know just up like suffer well together in in some weird way and, and I, I really appreciate that about this area that people are tough as hell um after graduating from dartmouth you linked up in austin and mlr and eventually followed sam harris to chicago what made you want to join up with the free jacks was it just the familiarity of some of those guys that you know or like you know the cult as you were talking about the culture was that uh, that was big for you yeah but both of those things are big so obviously the familiarity helps and having the kind of the context to get a good grasp on what the culture with the free jacks is like yeah, I just think you talk to most of the players and, and the staff. Um, you can you can really get a sense for like the genuine enjoyment and wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. um, that culture component and and I think what's being built and obviously has resulted in success is is something that's really attractive. Um, yes, and you know Scott and the guys, the teams that tend to have the success in the MLR, like you can really tell talking to the guys, they love being there. That's the most important bit is that culture really attracts that kind of talent and really gets guys bought in. And I think New England has that in spades. So 100%. Um, you know, we talked about this, you know, in the sh on the show, like we know that those guys in the locker room really, really enjoy being around each other. The culture has been built up that way, the way that they do the mini games, all that sort of stuff outside of rugby is developed so well with the free jacks. And it's that one percent that will get you over the line and, and, and take a season that could be mediocre or just completely suck into a you know playoff run or a championship type of thing. Because, you know, we, we know TK and, and Scott Matthew, they have their clear vision of what they want want so they're going to bring guys in but sometimes it just doesn't 
work. And we kind of are going to talk about that in a moment with Chicago. Uh, so cause you were there firsthand to talk, you know, to experience that. Uh, one of the other outriders on the show, Bozo, was convinced that the Chicago Hounds were going to be world beaters last year, but it really didn't develop uh, the way that he and a lot of people wanted to in that first year of the franchise. Can you give us an inside look of why Chicago struggled in that first season? Do you think? Yeah, I think I think there are obviously a lot of factors at play there. Um, mm. Culture is definitely a component, and not to say that Chicago has any sort of a bad culture or anything like that. Yep. Um, but I think it takes time to develop an identity yep. um, as a team. Um, and that's just not something that I think we were able to mesh together right away in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it was tough enough for a lot of the staff to kind of focus on their own job and getting everything swung into place so that Chicago could even compete last year. Mm -hmm. um, and that probably took away from the ability of the players to actually kind of centralize and focus on the rugby and the brand they wanted to bring. Um, it probably wasn't an exact match for the vision that Sam had either. So um, yeah. yeah, but it, it ended up being a mixed bag like that. I think people were on different pages. Um, we'll see how it goes for them this year. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, they could be a real, you know, contender, uh, definitely not a pretender, but a contender uh, for maybe, you know, some type of playoff run. We'll have to see. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see where Chicago lands. Uh, you know, that's a fantastic stadium. I would love to see the final back there again because it's a central location. You know, Chicago, huge city attractions outside of just the game itself. So we'll, we'll have to. We'll be looking closely at Chicago, I'm sure, because Bozo's going to put his his picks in. I imagine he'll have them high up again this year for, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. So um, let's talk about what type of conversations did you have with General Manager TK and Head Coach Scott Matthew prior to agreeing to join the, the team? What was those conversations like? Did they have a clear vision for what they wanted to do with you? Um, I think so. I, I think kind of luckily enough, especially at my position, the the needs are pretty obvious, you know, mm -hmm. what's nice about that though, is there's lots of room for expression. So, um, they're pretty clear about from a technical standpoint, if you handle set piece, line outs are good. Scrums are good. Um, you got a lot of room to operate outside of that. You can get around the park. You can be more of an attack minded, uh, hooker. You can, you can be, uh, staunch in defense and, and really go after that breakdown. Um, you can be a scrum operator. There are tons of different flavors. Um, of that in the game. So mm -hmm. um, in terms of what Scott sees me doing, um, I think he really wants me to give the freedom to kind of explore what my role is within the team. And it, it'll kind of vary depending on what our plan is kind of when we get into preseason and work things out. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like I said earlier, I, I think his philosophy and TK's philosophy in terms of management and coaching and getting in touch with the players and trusting them and giving them room to operate and, and really be themselves is something yep. that's really key to success, especially at this level um, mm -hmm. and generating that buy-in and that culture. So I, I think that goes miles and that was communicated to me pretty clear. So uh, yeah, it was a good fit for me. I thought. Awesome. I can't wait to get you out onto the pitch there at Fort Quincy, of course, but I wanted to ask like, how would you describe how you play rugby? Cause obviously, you know, you're talking about different molds of, of the hooker position. Like how do you describe how you play? Sure. Um, I think at the end of the day, I'm more defense minded. I like to get over the ball. Um, I like to steal breakdowns where I can. I like to get around the park and, and you know, make as big of an impact around the field, even if it's not super evident. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not necessarily one of those big X factor um, hookers that's going to get outside the 15s that often. Um, I did that a lot in Austin and Chicago, and it, um, you know, it, it was a different thing than I was used to, but. Um, I enjoyed it and it gave me a chance to improve different parts of my skill set, but I'm looking forward to really hammering the fundamentals, mm -hmm. really bringing that consistency kind of week to week. Um, that's really the biggest thing you can ask for out of hookers, just being consistent. Um, 100%. Nail down that ball security, keep quick ball, really allow okay. everybody else to play off of you. Absolutely. Love it. Um, yeah, uh, that's all for me. I, I know Dave's got some stuff that he wants to talk to you about, but I, I did uh, trim my mustache just to get it, you know, A plus level because I, I had the I had the king of the mustache on here. So I just wanted to, you know, match that level at least a little bit. So, Dave, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, absolutely. I would have I would have kept mine long, but I had a dentist appointment. And uh, if you've ever had a dentist get one of those hairs wrapped around a finger while they're going to work, man, let me it's tell trouble. you, it's, it's not much fun. So I, I went ahead and trimmed up. Um, <clears throat> when you were at Dartmouth, 
Uh, you initially were recruited as a football player, but very quickly made the jump to rugby. What were the circumstances around that? Any fallout, you know, there? Was that a difficult choice? And what were your reasons? Um, I wouldn't say it was a difficult choice, but not because there was any fallout. Yeah, it, it was just in a weird situation. The coach that had recruited me um, had left and not really communicated very much to me about it when I got there. So I was kind of, I also was coming in on a torn ACL. So uh, I, I really wasn't going to, at the earliest, I was going to be back that November, very late into the season anyway. Um, it, rugby was something I thought I was going to do in the spring, even if I did play football. Um, they were super open to me kind of the whole time period, and I just got kind of a better energy from them. Um, they worked a lot more closely with me on, on getting rehabbed and getting back into things, and it, it was a natural fit. I knew I was going to play rugby eventually. Um, I just enjoy it more. Yeah, nothing against football, but rugby is its own is its own breed, as I'm sure you guys know. So it was no question for me at the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah. Um, what was your football position? Um, I would I was a running back, more like a fullback, blocking back. I didn't have a whole yeah. lot of space in in the Dartmouth system at the time, anyway. <laughs> so I didn't see much of a future for myself. Yeah, that's that's tough. Um, my brother was a, a kicker in college at Kansas State, uh, but backed up Martin Gramatica, who went on to be one okay. of the better NFL kickers of the last uh, yeah. few years. And so he, you know, never saw a snap. Did like three years. Did his time in the trenches at practice, and uh, it's a it's a lot of work. It's a it's a huge huge commitment. Not that rugby's not, but football. I don't know what those huge squads in its own way. It's kind of you're you're a drop in an ocean sometimes. Sure. Um. Tell us a little bit about your senior year with uh, Dartmouth, specifically the Ivy League final and the cast removal mm, yeah. before that. Yeah, so we we played Brown sort of mid-October, early October. And during that game, I had broken my thumb. It was called a Bennett's fracture. So, um, And like I said, I, I'm interested in going to medicine and – that's the type of injury where your tendon really pulls on your thumb and you can kind of lose a lot of thumb function if you don't get it fixed soon. Okay. Um, it was one of the things, like I, I, I didn't know it was broken until a couple of days later when, it, when our trainer took a look at it and I couldn't, I couldn't pinch grip a piece of paper. Um, I ended up, so I ended up getting the surgery because, you know, I just felt like I had to, but I also didn't want to sacrifice playing you know, potentially the last game I'd ever play at Brophy at Dartmouth. It's a really special place, um, near and dear to my heart. So, um, I, I was almost manic kind of at the time after that surgery, I drank like a gallon of milk in two hours after <laughs> I had gotten home, <laughs> trying to heal the bone up as quickly as I could. Um, and I kind of, after enough pressing, um, of the training staff and, and my doctors and stuff, they kind of decided, Hey, I'm, I'm afraid he's going to remove the cast and play himself if we don't do it. So let's yeah. do it right. Uh, they cut it off me and, and molded me a nice little piece of something to, to at least keep the base of the joint from moving, hopefully. And, and I played that game. Excellent. Um, that's, I mean, that's commitment right there. I don't know how much deeper you got to look for, uh, it's, for that. And you were the, were you the captain that year? Who was right? the captain? It was a special, it's a special club. Um, yeah. obviously the leadership there is an honor, um, and something that kind of at my own expense, I didn't want to give up. So, um, yeah, if that tells you anything about how, how cool it is to be out there, it's yeah. just a reflection of that club. Oh, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I would guess that as, uh, you were a hooker at Dartmouth, is that right? Yeah. Uh, at least later on, I started in the back row. Okay. That's a good, but that's a good, I, I made the. Once you get in the front row, you don't really leave. Yeah, absolutely. Best place to be, in my yeah. opinion. Totally unbiased. <clears throat> um, did you call the lineouts when you were at Dartmouth? And did you have to make a transition? It seems like most of the teams in the MLR use a jumper, you know, to, to making the calls. Sure. Um, did you have to transition at some point from, like, calling it to listening to the calls? And was that, like, a tough jump to make? Um. I never had to make that transition. I would imagine that it would be pretty tough. Um, I know maybe some teams have the hooker call, but um, kind of in my mind, especially if, like the reason the MLR teams don't do it is 
you don't want this disjunction between how the jumpers and lifters in the line are acting and when the ball is coming in, like the timing is super important. And if, yeah. if there's only one guy calling it who's also doing the throwing, it's pretty easy for everybody to get off base. Um, so l luckily, I never had to do that. We had some pretty solid jumpers at Dartmouth while I was there that had a good grasp on the line out. So um, we did it that way. Excellent. <clears throat> I know uh, in in my club club days, so it's obviously pretty different. But it was uh, uh, you you would have to pry the line out call out of the hooker's cold dead <laughs> hands. I think it was just like one of the privileges of being the hooker was like it's my goddamn line out. You know, yeah. like that was the attitude. So uh, we were all a little bit afraid of them. Uh, you're coming here from a season in Chicago. It is. Uh, one of the more famous cities in the United States. I'm sure there were some things you found there that you loved. You grew up not too far from it. So what's something you're going to miss about Chicago? Oh, man. Um, I really enjoy the lake. Uh, lake Michigan, you know, being its own kind of unique thing, it seems like an ocean and it's not. Um, yep. But I, I was fortunate enough um, kind of from April on to live out near uh, like Shedd Aquarium which is for people know, who know Chicago, right on the lake. Um, there's a really nice park near there. Um, just a really cool place to live and walk around. Um, grab a Chicago dog on a walk through the park by the lake. Pretty iconic Chicago afternoon in the summer. So that's nice. Yeah, that's a pretty good answer. The third coast, right? Yeah. That's the whole Chicago lake mantra. Um, I've only been there for the MLR final very briefly and then continued on my way. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, getting back uh, at some point. In fact, I'm, I may be going in January. My You, uh, anybody, might be interested. My father is being inducted as a fellow in the American College of Veterinary Microbiologists. Oh, awesome. Yeah, after That's a cool. long lifetime of uh, scientific research and veterinary research. So we may go out there for that. It's a big event. Uh, That's really major, cool. Major career achievement. So we'll see. Maybe I'll have another Chicago story before too long. Um, today's the first day of Hanukkah. Christmas is coming up. What mm. is on your wish list this holiday season? Oh, I have a lot. Um, I'll need, I'll need a new fresh pair of boots. I always get one for Christmas. It's, it's a honor tradition for the last couple of years for me. Um, along with that, a good couple pairs of socks and underwear, um, got to freshen up for those, for those winter months and the training days getting out there. So. Um, I got to refresh the stock there. That's definitely number one and two on the list. <laughs> the essentials. I like it. A lot of utility, nothing frivolous, nothing frivolous. Not right now. We're a hundred percent business. Excellent. Speaking of a hundred percent business, I'm heard you, I've heard, you know, almost everything about dinosaurs. Oh, do you um, have a f favorite dinosaur? Interesting. And why? Yeah, I, I'm i a big fan of the Stegosaurus and its relatives for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I think kind of the combination of the like, multiple uses for those plates along the back being great for regulating temperature, being intimidating. You know, we thought maybe even a potential mating signal if they're, if they're bright and you flush those with, with blood, you get a nice red color out of them that maybe you're attracting mates of the Stegosaurus. Um, Two brains, two brains is big. It's a big plus. They've got that extra kind of gray matter tissue that um, we've kind of discovered in that hip area that might be running kind of the back end uh, on a reflex arc, which is which is cool. I just think I just find that interesting. Yeah, that's um, pretty wild. Yeah. It's about the Stegosaurus. Excellent. I I could appreciate that. Um, do you have a favorite animal fact? Mm. I mean, obviously dinosaurs are animals, but I mean non-extinct animal non-extinct animals uh, there's a lot of cool facts out there um and so yeah i studied a lot of um octopus psychology while i was at school i happened All to right. work in a lab for that um a, a cool fact about octopuses is, is they have so we think of them as like a, a central brain, kind of like us, the, all that brain tissue is in kind of that main head area, but they're pretty evenly distributed kind of across all their tentacles. So basically every tentacle has a brain okay. of its own. Um, and octopuses have a favorite tentacle and it's kind of random between those eight. So just like you, you're right or left-handed, <laughs> an octopus might have like 
the fourth right tentacle as its favorite. Um, I think they're cool animals, and there's a lot of cool things about octopuses I could rattle off, but That's there's a few. Excellent. I like that. We have one fan, uh, one listener, Chris Leninger here, saying octopuses are aliens. You cannot tell me otherwise, which is pretty good. It, pretty solid is, argument. They, they're just they're organized so differently, right? But at the same time, they've got so much in common with us that, that we don't realize, so... So who knows? We're built out of the same stuff. I like it. Uh, all right. We're going to play a little bit of Not My Job now. So okay. you look a little bit like an old-timey boxer. You got that sure. look, you know, the mustache, which is a compliment, by the way. Um, we're going to ask a few questions about John L. Sullivan, the final mm. bare-knuckle boxing champion of the world. So John L. Sullivan was born here in Boston, in Roxbury to Irish immigrant parents who very badly wanted him to become a priest, which he did not do. What career did he choose briefly before, as he put it, uh, being driven into pugilism? Was he a, a professional baseball player, B, a barber who specialized in perfectly curled mustaches, or C, a longshoreman at Boston Harbor? Hmm. I, I'm going to have to go with C. I, f I feel like that makes the most sense. He seems like a guy that would still enjoy baseball. Yeah, it may make the most sense, but he was actually a professional baseball player Huge. briefly. No way. Yeah, he was a multi-sport athlete. Man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next question. Bare Knuckle Boxing came to an end with the adoption of a new set of rules in 1867, which required gloves for both fighters and for gloves to be replaced if broken or destroyed during the bout. This new set of rules was named after which of these people or groups? Was it A, the Marquess of Queensbury? B, the Gentleman's Order of Fisticuffs? Or C, Admiral Tarrington's Royal and Honorable Society of Pugilists. Mm. I like the sound of Admiral Tarrington. It was, in fact, the Marquess of Queensbury. Boxing still wow. generally with some modifications. Follows the Marquess of Queensbury rules. That would give us the three-minute round and the one-minute break in between. Okay. Limitations on anyone entering the ring except the boxers. Uh, the weirdest rule, because, of course, I went and read all the Marquess of Queensbury rules, you know, to make this quiz. Uh, the weirdest rule, if a match has to be, st uh, a bout has to be stopped because of some kind of outside interference or, or you know, force, force of nature, the referee must immediately name when and where the match will continue. Just on the spot, like, your name, like, right now, where are we going? Because this fight is not over. I like that. Interesting. I wonder where the wildest place uh, according rematch or continuation right. of was fought. That's interesting. Yeah. There's a heavy emphasis in the rules, it seems, on wagering, which makes sense. And so I yeah. think that is a rule that's there to prevent, like, the game somehow causing the bout to be stopped in order to prevent a particular <laughs> outcome for betting reasons. That's my, that's my gotcha. historian's sense. lens. There. Very cool. We're learning things here. Yeah. That's how we do it here. Good. Um, our final question, the final bare knuckle championship bout took place in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1889. What did the governor of Mississippi do in immediate response to the fight? Did he a invite the winner, which was Sullivan from Boston to the, his mansion for a party that raged all week? Did he b declare Mississippi the roughest, toughest, rootinest, tootinest state in the union? Or did he c offer a $1,000 bounty for both Sullivan and his opponent because the fight was illegal. Oh, interesting. Uh, B and C are very at odds. Whether uh, Basically, it's a how, how root and tootin do I think Mississippi is. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with, I think there's a, a southern gentlemanliness going on here that he, that he put a bounty on the fighters because it was illegal. That's exactly correct. The location was kept secret. Um, hundreds of people were ferried there on steamboats at the last minute from like staging areas because you got to have a good crowd for a fight, right? So you need you need an audience there, but you can't tell them where they're going to be. 
And apparently it was quite a week down in, in Louisiana and Mississippi as people were trying to figure out where this fight, which was obviously going to happen, was actually going to happen. Uh, thank you. This has been fun. Thank you for indulging both the real and the ridiculous questions. Um, and I can't wait to see you this coming year in 2024 out at Fort Quincy. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Before we get you out of here, Mason, I just want you to speak directly to the Rangers, the Free Jacks fans out there, since you are a new signing that will be coming in in 2024. What do you have to say to the great Free Jacks fans out there? Yeah, um, yeah I've been watching afar for a couple of years, and um, I, I'm really inspired by the commitment you guys have to the Free Jacks and what has been able to, um, to be built over there. Um, kind of like I said early on to some of the the guys running the socials at the Free Jacks, like you know, Boston's got a legendary sports community, and and you guys are just a part of it, as much a part of it as anywhere else. Um, obviously, coming into the season, losing the rivalry with New York potentially, and and some of the more familiar faces that you guys would see the Free Jacks play against is a, a bit of a different setting, and that's one of the most fun things about Boston sports to me. Um, but just keep doing what you're doing. I, I think the guys love the support and it's a huge part of how we build our culture internally. Like I, I can't speak for everybody else, obviously, but um, we derive a ton of inspiration from that um, and seeing, seeing those butts and seats um, really gets us going come game time. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, man, this has been fantastic. Thank you for coming on here. We're going to say one word to exit the video. Uh, it is huzzah, of course. And we're going to say that in three, Two, one, huzzah! huzzah. Woo!